Hello. The purpose of this talk is to introduce you to a few principles of curriculum design that I think would be helpful in having schools use their curriculum in a more principled way to meet the needs of students in the future. Uh, there are many principles that we need to think about when we're thinking about curriculum, but I think the, the principles that I'm going to share with you today are the ones that will be most helpful in shaping the curriculum of each individual school. So first we need to think about why we educate people. And if you look at slide two, it says that there are basically four really big, broad sets of reasons as to why we educate people. I think that the most important is preparation for life. The, the idea of enabling young people to take better control over their own lives. That to me is hugely important. Second is, is transmission of culture. What Matthew Arnold called passing on from one generation to the next, the great things that have been thought and said. It's also important to prepare young people for democratic citizenship. People need to understand important political issues to discharge their responsibilities effectively uh, in a democratic society. And fourthly, um, I think the most important reason, one of the most important reasons is to prepare students for the world of work. And I'm not saying that any one of these is more important than others, but, but I, it seems to me that the world of work is the one that's changing fastest. And that may be one that schools need to think about how we're preparing students for the future. Now, the term curriculum has been around for a long time. It appears to be first used in Scotland in the 17th century. And it was uh, describing all the courses that students took. Uh, Ralph Tyler, in a very famous book written in 1949, but still in print uh, many years later, said that there were four reasons, that we, four, four big principles that we should think about, four big, if you like, objectives, uh, or processes we need to go through to plan a curriculum. The first is starting out by what educational purposes should schools seek to attain, and then we think about the experiences that students need to attain those outcomes. We then think about how we should organise these uh, principles through things like timetabling and, and courses that students take, and then the assessment component, how can we determine whether these objectives have been effectively uh, met. Uh, John Kerr actually focused on uh, the, the role of the school as being the organiser of the curriculum, but not necessarily the provider of everything. So he talked about all the learning which is planned or guided by the school, whether it's carried out individually, inside or outside the school. So anything that students learn that's organised by the school could be counted as part of the curriculum, whether it actually happened during the normal timetable day or not. And Dennis Lawton, in 1975, came up with quite an ingenious definition. He pointed out that really, the, we can't put everything we want students to know into the, the curriculum. So he pointed out that curriculum is essentially a selection from culture. In 1975, Lawrence Stenhouse suggested that, in fact, a, the best way to think about curriculum was not as a set of things that are in the books or, or in ring binders, but an educational proposal. What, a vision of what classrooms should look like. And he said a curriculum is an attempt to communicate the essential principles of an educational proposal in a form that's open to critical scrutiny and capable of effective translation into practice, as shown on slide four. And that's very important because Lawrence Stenhouse's definition required us to involve teachers. You can talk about things that go into ring binders in the national curriculum, for example, in the abstract, but if you require that as part of the curriculum you have to talk about how it can be effectively translated into practice, then you cannot exclude teachers from that. Teachers create curriculum every day. So it seems to me that we could actually talk about having a big debate about what bits of culture should be included in the curriculum if we go along with Dennis Lawton's definition, or we could talk about what kinds of things we want students to experience in schools, as uh, Lawrence Stead has proposed. But the danger with such an approach is that it becomes each person's wish list of things they want to do. So people talk about, I want my favourite topic and you have your favourite topic, and that's what goes in the curriculum. It's a kind of horse trading game. And obviously a degree of that is necessary. But I think it's very important that we have a curriculum that, in a school that actually is defensible. So we can actually say, when people ask why is the curriculum like it is, we can say, well, here are the principles that lay behind the construction of this curriculum. And I think there are several principles that are useful to bear in mind. The first is that it's balanced. The second is that it's rigorous. 
The third is that it's coherent. The fourth is that it's vertically integrated. The fifth is that it's appropriate. The sixth is that it's focused or parsimonious. And finally, that it's relevant to the needs of the students. So I'm going to go through each of those topics in, in those principles in order and say a little bit about each of them. So first of all, what do we mean by balanced? Well, we have to make sure that we do all the things that we need to do. And a balanced curriculum needs to include reading, writing, mathematics, of course. But there are also a lot of subjects that we don't currently teach, but that might be quite useful things to be putting on the curriculum. Drama. Drama is very important. A group of business people in the 1980s were asked to agree what they wanted 16-year-olds to be able to do when they left school. When they eventually gained consensus, the only school subject we found that satisfied all the requirements of the business people was drama. Dance, chess, we do DMT in schools, but actually how does that articulate with engineering in universities? So maybe we should be doing engineering. We could talk about geology or astronomy, media studies. Law is a very popular subject at university, but the question is, what does study of that subject look like when students are 12, 13, 14, 15? Do we want to put that on the curriculum? So the point is that any curriculum is a choice. We put in some things, we leave out other things, and we need to be clear about why we're putting them in. We're putting them in to be balanced, but then as well as that, and turning to slide seven, we also need our sub subjects to be rigorously studied. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily a formal rigorous uh, approach. What I'm saying is that when we include subjects, they need to be taught in schools in a way that is faithful to the way of thinking that that subject actually embraces. Uh, some people call these disciplinary habits of mind. Now, these disciplinary habits of mind are, are very powerful, but disciplinarily specific ways of thinking about things. In mathematics, students learn about transformation and invariance, the idea that adding zero to a number doesn't change it, multiplying by one doesn't change it. And so the idea that something can be done that doesn't change something is a very big idea in mathematics, and that is studied at, at more and more advanced levels throughout the whole of mathematics. In, in history, we want to know about the provenance of documents. Just having a document by itself doesn't tell you much about it. We need to know where it came from. We need to know the context under which it was created. So historians, whenever they see a document, they want to know about its provenance and its context. In statistics, uh, statisticians know that means are very, very um, unreliable guides to data. They're telling you that the mean of a data set doesn't tell you very much about the data at all because they can be spread out or they can be very narrowly grouped. And so they also look at dispersion. And that's why a statistician realizes that somebody with one foot in boiling water and one foot in freezing water isn't on average comfortable. In sociology, people study uh, the way that people behave, and one of the big old questions in sociology is, do people behave the way they do because of who they are, or because of the structures that, could, that constrain the way that they think? And the, these two ideas are often called structure and agency. So in sociology, you learn to think about structure and agency. Now the point about these big ideas is they are disciplinarily specific. You only learn these ideas by studying those subjects in depth but they are powerful ways of thinking about the world. At this stage, people often mention 21st century skills. And the problem with 21st century skills is that they are very difficult to define. One uh, very laudable attempt was attempted by the National Academies of Science in the United States. And they pointed out that there are cognitive competencies. There are things like knowledge and creativity that need to be there. There are things like intrapersonal competencies you know, people's openness to new ideas or intellectual openness, uh, they, they, how conscientious they are, um, and the way that they think about work, the, the way that they think they can actually take forward their plans, that they feel that they're agents of their own fortunes. And then finally, interpersonal competencies, uh, teamwork and leadership, as shown on slide eight. Now, th there is no doubt that these are very powerful, big ideas. But what we're learning in the work on 21st century skills is that the skills that people value turn out to be very highly specific to a discipline. So for example, creativity, people think is very important. And that's absolutely right. Uh, creativity is gonna be very important in the future because it's, we, it's something we know that computers can't do. 
But the important thing to realise is that creativity is different in different subjects. So in mathematics, deciding that two and two is going to equal three, not four, is not creative. It's just silly, because you've actually destroyed the whole of mathematics. What you have is no longer mathematics. It's not sensible. So being creative is specific to a discipline. You have to know the rules of the discipline, if you like, before you can learn how to break them and be creative or to work at the edge of a discipline. Everybody agrees that critical thinking is an important skill. But it turns out that critical thinking in mathematics is different from critical thinking in history. We know this because no amount of training people to think critically in history will make them better at critical thinking in mathematics. So these 21st century skills are important, but they're not things we can do in one context and expect them to be available in another context. I think the best way to think about these 21st century skills is as audit tools for our curriculum. So when we look at our science curriculum, we should go through the checklist of 21st century skills. Are we encouraging creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration and communication in science? And when we look at our history cur curriculum, we should look at the same list. We should look for critical thinking and creativity and problem solving and communication and collaboration. It's a mistake to think that some subjects are creative subjects and others are not. Creative, creativity is a part of all subjects, as is critical thinking, as is communication, as is collaboration, as is problem solving. If we teach kids to solve problems in one context, it's highly unlikely that that will generalise to others. If we want them to solve problems in history, we have to teach them to solve problems in history. Moving on to slide nine. Um, the third requirement is that the curricula are coherent. So, subject-based curricula are very powerful. They develop disciplinary skills. But the danger is that each subject develops those skills in its own little silo. And that can be very powerful, but then it tends to be not so useful for helping students see the connections across topics. In many primary schools, for example, it's common to do topic work or theme-based work, and that's very good for stressing the connections across different aspects of curriculum, but then it's difficult to make sure that the curriculum discipline is well represented. So for example, when students are doing problem solving, they may actually come across a mathematical problem, but choose to solve it in a non-mathematical way. There's nothing wrong with that, but the point is it doesn't develop the mathematical skills. The important point is that we need to think both horizontally and vertically about the curriculum. For example, the mathematics department might think the best time to teach equations and graphs is in year nine, but the science department might need them in year eight. So within the school, we have to look at how coherent the experience that the students are getting so that actually things are being done at the right time for other subjects, as well as following the internal logic of each individual subject. If we're looking at the skills in detail, and this is turning to slide 10, it turns out that what we want students to be able to do in terms of coherence across the, across the curriculum depends quite a lot on knowledge. So this is a passage from Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. And there's a quotation here, which I'd like you to spend a couple of moments reading. Okay, so there's probably one word in that quotation that you're not familiar with, and that is manifold. And by manifold, uh, Kant meant the sense data that was experienced by the human. So basically all the information coming in through the eyes or the ears or whatever. So the manifold is the set of sensory experiences. Um, and so if that was the term you didn't understand, then you should now be able to uh, decide which of the four answers to that question is correct. So take a minute or so to discuss with a neighbour. See if you can work out which of those four answers is the correct response to that question. Now, most people find that question impossible to understand. But here's what's interesting. The difficulty with that question is not caused by the fact that you didn't understand the words. The difficulty is caused by the fact that you couldn't form a mental representation of what Immanuel Kant was talking about. If you don't understand the point he was trying to make in this paragraph, if you don't have the background knowledge about what Kant is trying to do, then you have no chance of getting the question right, even though you understand every single word 
in the passage. Now, it turns out that what Kant was trying to get over is that all intuitions occur through categories, and that's why response three is the correct answer. The point he's making is that comprehension depends on constructing a mental model that makes the elements fall into place. And that requires a lot of background knowledge. And he's saying that basically, uh, one of the reasons the students can't read things effectively is not because they cannot decode the individual words, it's because they lack the background knowledge that is required to help these things fall into place. If you like, a structure of ideas onto which the passage they're reading can be slotted. And that's why a coherent curriculum needs also to develop knowledge as students go along, uh, not just the, the, um, the skills of that subject, but the background knowledge in reading, for example, so that they can actually understand what they're reading about. And as Hollis Scarborough makes clear this rather interesting model of reading comprehension, what she points out is that, of course, there are lots of very basic skills involved in reading, like phonological awareness and decoding and word recognition. But as students get better at reading, these things become increasingly automatic. You don't have to think about them. You look at a word and you recognize it immediately for what it is. You don't have to work out what the letters are. You see it, you understand it. But that then gets collated with a set of much more strategic ideas around language knowledge, around genres, around factual knowledge. And high quality reading is actually a, an integration of all these things together. So as students become better at reading, the, the low level processes become increasingly automatic and the high level processes become increasingly strategic. So when you read a particular passage, a high level reader would be aware of what genre this passage is located in. And so you read it with an understanding of the genre and the kinds of things that this genre uh, has as standard forms of a reference, for example, and not just the decoding of the words. And this is rather nicely illustrated by this model in slide 12. Um, so E.D. Hirsch, who's looked very carefully at these ideas, points out that academic skills are both procedural and content-based. Procedural skills such as turning letters into sounds must be learned very quickly. As content, along with other content necessary to higher order skills. And an advancing skill entails an increase in the speed of processing and that means that reading comprehension requires activating prior knowledge and if the prior knowledge isn't there then students aren't able to read not because they can't decode the words but because the background knowledge that would enable them to form a representation or what they're hearing about would not be there. Um, now when you want to think about how this coherence develops there are a number of frameworks out there one that's very useful I think is the solo taxonomy by Biggs and Collis, it's been around for quite a while, and they talk about how we might choose ideas for a curriculum based on the complexity of what's called the observed learning outcomes. That's what SOLO stands for, it's the structure of the observed learning outcome. So we don't worry about what's going on in kids' heads, we wonder about what is actually in the work that they do. And I think, for example, in history, this might guide us in the preparation of history curricula. Well, the one thing we do know, despite what the government often proposes, the one thing we do know is that when somebody gets better at history, it's not just knowing more facts and dates. We see students understanding chronology and cause and effect. And so, for example, one dimension of improvement in history is moving from very simple cause and effect relationships, this caused that, towards events having multiple causes, and then at a high level still, having multiple interacting causes. Now this actually gives us a clue as to how to organise our curriculum. With very young children, for example, we might start with, with events where a single cause and effect relationship is actually a reasonably faithful representation of what happened. As we look towards more advanced skills, we look for evidence. Uh, we look for topics where you have multiple causes leading to the same effect. And then at a high level still, you would choose historical topics where the causes interact and it's impossible to understand the effect without understanding the interaction between the causes and the high level still. So the point is that this kind of structure allows us to think about the design of the curriculum. We choose things at the level that they're appropriate for because they can develop student skills in helping them move towards more sophisticated ways of thinking about our subject. I want to illustrate this with a very a, a small, possibly trivial example. So on slide 13, you have a question about 
how we might sequence the teaching of topics in mathematics. So I've given you some polygons there, five of them, in alphabetical order. I would just like to, for you to discuss with a neighbour, in which order would you teach those polygons and how to find their area? The parallelogram, rectangle, square, trapezium and triangle. In which order would you teach kids to find the areas of those shapes? Okay, so in England, the most common order is to start off with the square and then go on to the rectangle and then the triangle and then the parallelogram and then the trapezium. In Japan, partly as a result of what they call lesson study, where teachers have thought about this very carefully at a very detailed level, they will start out with the area of the rectangle because then there's no need to teach the area of a square. It's just a special kind of rectangle. They will then go on to the parallelogram. And the reason for that is this. You can always put two triangles together to get a parallelogram, but you cannot put two triangles together to get a rectangle unless it's a right angle triangle. So the point is that by choosing very carefully the sequence of shapes, rectangle, parallelogram, triangle, trapezium, you actually make for a much smoother development and the ideas fit together more coherently and students are able then to remember it better because they can reconstruct the rules if they actually forget them. And what is interesting about this, this process of lesson study, for example, in Japan, is that they will spend literally months fine-tuning one lesson, for example, on something as straightforward as the areas of simple polygons. Because it's only by actually trying these ideas out, trying different permutations, can you find out which one works better. And that fine scale makes a great deal of difference to how easy the curriculum is for students to master. Now these progressive hierarchies are um, important, but they're not always given to us. So it's probably quite reasonable to assume that we should teach students how to add before we teach them how to multiply. That's probably quite straightforward. Um, in mathematics, it may be also obvious to teach, for example, multiplication before division. It turns out that that's not obvious. Computationally, multiplication is much easier than division. It's easier for students to do a multiplication than it is for them to do a division. However, in terms of concepts, it turns out that division is easier to understand than multiplication. This was demonstrated in the CSMS research in the 1970s and 80s, where researchers gave students number facts and asked them to construct stories concerning those number facts. And what they found was that students could construct a story for a fact like 12 divided by 4 equals 3. They would say something like, there were 12 suites and they were divided between four people, so they got three each. But the same students couldn't construct a story for three times four equals 12. They would say things like, Jane had three suites and John had four suites, and they multiplied them to get 12, or some other similarly nonsensical response. So it turns out that although computationally, multiplication should come before division, conceptually, they, it probably makes sense to teach division first and multiplication second. So it turns out that the order in which you teach things depends on your approach to the teaching. I mentioned earlier, I think it makes sense to teach areas of triangles after the area of parallelogram. That's an arbitrary choice. And of course, in history, it's whether we teach the Romans before the Vikings, it, it literally makes no sense at all to teach the Romans before the Vikings just because it's historically prior. This comes to the idea of, of the spiral curriculum. And this idea is due to Jerome Bruner. And this idea is very misused because in his definition of the spiral curriculum, Bruner was very clear about the conditions that needed to apply before we should actually spiral the curriculum. And I'll give you a minute to read this quote. Now, what is important about this quote, I think, is that Bruner says that the fact that a student can do something at an earlier age than they would normally be taught it is not enough. In other words, we only teach something to somebody if they can do it at an intellectually honest level, and not having done it as a child makes them less, um, less knowledgeable as an adult. In other words, they bet they're, they're worse off as an adult if they haven't understood it as a child. And that creates a very high bar. 
So when we think about the curriculum, we, co we of course can do stuff at a very early age with students in a pretty trivial way. But he would say that unless a student is better off as an adult, having done it earlier, then it's just cluttering up the curriculum. I think that's another, another very important principle about, about curriculum design. So we should think very carefully about the kinds of spirals we have, as is laid out in slide 18. So basically, anything can usefully be revisited. So of course students should spiral around, so we can always go around and, and revisit topics. If they've forgotten them, they need to be refreshed. But the point is that really, spirals come into their own when they're an essential part of the curriculum. And I would say that most of the spirals that I see in curriculum design are not particularly effective. So you could say, you know, you might need this later. I don't think that's strong enough. You could say, you will need this later. And that is getting towards a decent reason. This is useful now, even if you don't go any further. That's an even more important reason. But I think the best reason is the criterion that Bruno himself applied. You will need this later, and you'll be significantly disadvantaged if you do not learn it now. That, to me, is the really important kind of spiral that we should have in our curriculum. These spirals need, of course, to be designed backwards. And I think that's the, one of the most difficult things about curriculum is that teaching has to be delivered forwards, but has to be designed backwards. And this is reminiscent of Kierkegaard's famous dictum that the tragedy of life is that one could only understand life going back, looking backwards, but it has to be lived going forwards. And in the same way, curricula need to be designed in terms of outcomes, but can only be delivered in terms of experiences. And that's why I think there is a quite a useful interplay between experience and out, experiences and outcomes. And I think we'll have too limited a curriculum if we only ever design our curriculum by working backwards from aims and objectives. Sometimes I think there should be things in our curriculum that is just good for students to have experienced. You don't say they're going to learn a lot from it. The fact is, this is a good thing for them to be experienced. I think this idea was nicely articulated in Scotland in their Curriculum for Excellence, because in their Curriculum for Excellence, all their curriculum statements lay out both experiences and outcomes for learners. And so I've actually got on slide 20, you can read what they think should be happening in dance. I think one important point, of course, is to say that actually Scotland is one of the few countries that think that dance should be part of their national curriculum. But what is, I think, quite elegant about the way they, they have done it is that the experiences and outcomes lay out in a quite a, a, a clever way the totality of experiences we want students to experience. Some of them will be designed backwards from what you want students to be able to achieve, and some of them are things we just want students to experience while they're at school. The next principle is that the curriculum should be appropriate. And this raises real challenges because students learn at very different speeds. If you take a very simple question like, what is the result of adding 860 to 570? Turns out that when students are about six and a half years old, why 15% of students can do it. But not until they're 11 can 90% of students do it. So over five years, the proportion of students who can do this goes up by about 75%. So that means that in a class of 30, only four or five children learn this in any one year, as is shown on slide 21. Now, of course, this skill is one that all primary school teachers value. So students are being taught it as early as the age of six, but not all of them are getting it until beyond the age of 11. So the range of, of achievement in a class is actually extraordinarily large. This rather complicated graph shows how the spread of achievement changes over time. Most people think that if you take a group of 15-year-olds and compare them to a group of 14-year-olds, then the 15-year-olds would know a lot more than the 14-year-olds. But it turns out that actually 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds look very similar. There's a slight increase in the mean, but the achievement range is very spread out. And so the thing to remember is that in a class of 11-year-olds, you will have some students who could outperform 16-year-olds and other students who can't actually match what seven-year-olds can do. The range of achievement is very large. And even if a school uses something like setting, the point remains that no matter how finely you set, the range of achievement within every class is very great. So how you deal with the huge range and how you make sure the curriculum is appropriate is very difficult. 
Uh, some people have responded to this by having a kind of what they call an age or stage choice. So the, the traditionally, we, we promote students socially and we have older students going up into new classes. Uh, other schools have adopted what they call um, a stage, not age approach. So they will group students together by ability and, and in a primary school you might have very, very um, high achieving seven-year-olds learning mathematics alongside uh, average 11-year-olds. Um, the advantage of the key stage based approach where you actually group students by in the key stage together, um, you can have different students working together on diff at different ages on the same thing. You can actually build huge flexibility in and you can group students by their, by their current achievement. If you lock students into uh, an age by, a year by year approach, then you know that students will be covering things at the same time, so that supports the coherence across the curriculum and it makes sure that all students are getting this. The downside of the year-by-year -year approach is that it restricts teachers' freedom to plan different curricular sequences and you could actually also argue that because you need to put things into different years, you're actually promoting the atomization of the curriculum because you have to tie things down. The key, the key stage approach, as I said earlier, allows flexibility and it's very easy then to deal appropriately with different students in the same class but of course the coherence across different aspects of learning are difficult because you can't guarantee that all students are doing something at the same time and it may of course also allow teachers not to teach things to students that they really do need to be learning at that point. Uh, as with all the other principles here there's no simple uh, solution here all of the ideas uh, that I'm presenting to you are not kind of dials we need to to, to check are okay. We're always going to have con con conflicts and trade-offs. The important thing is to look at each of these principles and see whether the trade-offs that you're making are ones that you're comfortable with and if not you might need to return and look in more detail at the curriculum. The next principle is that the curriculum should be focused and that means really doing a small number of things well rather than covering everything. The temptation is to put everything in and uh, we end up with a curriculum that was described by William Schmidt, a science educator, as a curriculum that's a mile wide and an inch deep. The depressing thing is that this was realised a long time ago by many people. One was Richard Livingstone, who at the time was president of Corpus Christi College at the University of Oxford, and writing in 1941, he said the following, the test of successful education is not the amount of knowledge that a pupil takes away from school, but his appetite to know and his capacity to learn. If the school sends out children with a desire for knowledge and some idea how to acquire and use it, it will have done its work. Too many leave school with the appetite killed and the mind loaded with undigested lumps of information. The good schoolmaster is known by the number of valuable subjects which he declines to teach. And I think the important word in that paragraph is valuable. We cannot make a good curriculum simply by leaving out the unimportant material. Because there's so much important material there. The only way we can come up with a good curriculum is to leave out valuable material to give us more time to put more emphasis and more depth onto the even more valuable material. Uh, one attempt to do this is shown in slide 25. Um, Wynn Harlan, uh, a science educator from Scotland, convened an international group and what they tried to do was to work out what, the, what were the 10 big ideas of science. Now, you, know, you will probably have your own preferences about what should be in the curriculum or not, but I thought the idea of coming up, coming up with 10 big ideas that should direct the curriculum from the age of 5 to 16 was well worth serious consideration. Obviously, if you adopt this approach, a lot of important topics will be left out. But the plus is that you have time to deal with these topics in enough depth so that students can learn about what science is really all about and when they come to study new topics, as they'll have to, then they will understand enough about how science works for those topics to be slotted into place quite easily. The danger is, by covering all the topics we think the students might ever need in the future, nothing gets done very well, so it becomes this mile wide and inch deep approach. The other interesting thing about the attempt by Wynne Harlan and her colleagues was they also decided to have, as well as 10 big ideas of science, they also had four big ideas about science. Uh, so the idea that science actually produces knowledge in particular ways that students need to understand. Again, you might have different opinions, but the idea of trying to restrict oneself 
to a small number of big ideas that permeate the whole curriculum from 5 to 16, I think bears serious consideration. And the final principle is the idea that the curriculum should be relevant to the individual student. And of course students are so different, it's a very difficult balance to pull off. But I think one of the useful things to think about here is the idea of informed choice. So in medicine, it's agreed now that a student, sorry, that a, a patient cannot consent to an operation without being informed about the risks of the procedure. So it's not just choosing yes or no, it's also making an informed choice. And it's up to the doctors to make sure that the choice they make has been informed by all the relevant evidence. And I think that idea is quite a useful way of thinking about how to make sure the curriculum is relevant to the students. I think the idea of informed choice there is very powerful. So first of all, there's informed choice about how to learn. Uh, and then the other one is about what to learn. So our evidence, as we work with younger and younger children, is that students, even at the age of four and five, have extraordinary insights about how they learn. And so it seems to me that in terms of pedagogy, in terms of how students should be being taught things, I think we should be listening to them from the earliest possible age. So for very young children, we should be telling them how, uh, we should be involving them in decisions about how they like to learn. However, in terms of what they should be learning, I think that we need to be much more cautious about letting them make decisions that might subsequently cause them to be um, disadvantaged in, in, the, in a way in the future. So for example, um, if they, you know, if students have no interest in learning to read at the age of five or six, I think that's fine. But if they're not reading by the time they're seven, then that's becoming an issue. And therefore, I don't think the students know enough about the consequences of not being able to read to make their own choice themselves. I think it's okay for us to say, you need to learn to read now. And for that choice to be taken away from the students. So I think the students need to understand the consequences and if they don't understand the consequences, they cannot make smart decisions. And so here are some of the things I think they need to be bearing in mind. The first is intrinsic factors. What is the subject really like? If students say maths is boring, uh, it, that seems to me that they really haven't understood what mathematics is about. If they think that history is all about facts and dates, they haven't really understood about what history is all about so that they, they haven't really ever studied the subject as it's understood by experts. And so therefore, they can't make an informed choice. Uh, have they had authentic experiences of that subject? Or has it been uh, in a second-hand way that actually hasn't captured the, 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 the big, big ideas? Does it fit in with a developing identity? Uh, many students, decide not to study science because they think that the people who study science have to end up wearing white lab coats and being geeks in a laboratory. The fact is that a science education can lead you to all kinds of careers outside laboratories. And if students don't understand that, then any decision to drop science because they don't want to look like a geek in a lab coat isn't an informed choice. Uh, students need to understand the importance of subject as critical filters. So it's quite common to understand to, to find students, for example, dropping chemistry, even though they want to be a doctor, because they think biology is what you need to be a doctor. The General Medical Council only requires one subject to have been studied at A-level if you want to train as a doctor, and that's chemistry. So students often don't understand that, um, that there are certain subjects that are absolutely required for future study in a particular area. And then other subjects, and mathematics is a good example, act as a critical filter. If you, if you haven't got this subject, for example, you know, if you're not good at mathematics, without A-level mathematics, engineering is very, very difficult to study effectively at university. Um, and mathematics in particular is one where it's very difficult to get back into. So as soon as you stop studying mathematics, it's very hard to get back into that at the, at the right level. And the other thing to think about is whether there are any sensitive periods. So for example, it turns out that learning the sounds of a language students do very much better before adolescence. So maybe we should be spending our curriculum in the primary schools introducing to students to the sounds of a language because there is a sensitive period for learning the sounds of a language. Um, but for the syntax and the vocabulary, um, if there is a sensitive period, it's open at least until the age of 25. 
So again, those kinds of decisions should factor into whether we let students decide not to study a subject beyond a particular level. And in this slide, I just, just want to um, give people a quick demonstration of what, for example, a subject that many students would like to drop as soon as possible, mathematics, um, could be like. So you have these equations like e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. So e is a number that comes up in a lot of um, nat natural settings. i is the square root of minus 1. It doesn't really exist, so it's an imaginary number. And pi is the ratio of the circumference of a diameter, uh, a circumference of a circle to its diameter. And it turns out that e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. And uh, everybody who comes across that equation, once they understand it, think it's pretty amazing. If you don't understand it, you don't really understand what mathematics is about. Another example is Torricelli's trumpet. Torricelli uh, was a, a famous mathematician who actually realised that if you take part of the curve of y equals 1 over x and rotate it around the x-axis, you, and you take the portion of that from um, where x equals 1 all the way up to infinity, you get this trumpet that is infinitely long. But it turns out that the volume of that trumpet is finite. Even more strangely, the surface area is infinite. So you actually have this shape that you could fill with paint, but you couldn't paint. Again, most people, when they get their heads around that, find that pretty amazing. Euler's relation for um, solids, cubes, tetrahedra, octahedra, icosahedra, dodecahedra, and in fact, any other, almost any other shape you can make in solid geometry has this amazing relationship that the number of faces plus the number of vertices is two more than the number of edges. And finally, I'm just going to talk about the alternating harmonic series. Again, it's the numbers you get when you take 1 over each of the counting numbers. So 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4. That's the harmonic series. When you alternate 1 minus a half plus a third minus a quarter and carry out forever, the amazing thing about that is that, the, that you can prove that if you sum up those numbers in a different sequence, you actually get a different total. So everybody understands that with ordinary arithmetic, if you take two numbers and add them up in the opposite order, 2 plus 3 is always going to be the same as 3 plus 2. But with the harmonic series, if you add them up in a different sequence, you get different totals. And in fact, you can prove that you can actually arrange that sequence so you can actually get the total by adding up all the terms together up to infinity to be any answer you like. Now these may be beyond most people's understanding, but I think they go to show how a subject that many students have little time for, mathematics, could be made more exciting, could be a source of awe and wonder for students. So uh, the final point then is to go back and review the main principles. What I'm suggesting is that a good curriculum should be balanced, rigorous, coherent, vertically integrated so that it promotes progression, appropriate, focused or parsimonious, and relevant to the needs of students. These curriculum principles are never going to be all satisfied at the same time. There's never going to be a curriculum that does all these things. But by holding these principles in mind as you design your curriculum, I think it may be possible to find ways of having resolutions of the tensions that these principles will create that will actually be productive in deciding what young people should be learning at your school. Thank you.